My father worked for almost 50 years as a life insurance salesman, not because he liked it, because he didn't. He did it because he had three kids that he wanted to see grow up in a neighborhood that was safe and secure. A safe home surrounded by a community of neighbors who cared for each other. Band-aids for skinned knees, July 4th parties, block parties that went on for hours, crocheted baby blankets when a new child was born, casseroles when we'd lost a loved one. He worked hard day and night to provide those things for the people that he loved. Larry English was a contractor in Douglas, Georgia, who worked hard every day to provide for his wife and two children, and to save for his dream to live on the water in a neighborhood just like that, safe, secure, filled with people who would care for each other. And when he became ill, he and his wife, Amy, had to fast forward their dreams. They fast forwarded that retirement dream, bought that land, and began working on their dream home, the project of building that home in Satilla Shores. It's the sort of life we all have the right to seek the safety and security and comfort of people that we care about and who care about us. We work hard for our stuff. It's ours, and no one has the right to take it. And we should never, ever have to fear intruders. The police can be counted on to help, to respond, but they can't be everywhere, and they can't be everything. A good neighborhood is always policing itself. Ugh. Mr. Moore, you really need to put a fence around that swimming pool. I'm worried a child will fall in. Mrs. Pennock, <laughs> Bobby is flying down Crossbrook Drive again in that new car. You have to talk with him and get him to slow down so no one is hurt. The police can't be everywhere, and in a safe, secure neighborhood, police are helped by those neighbors. Officer Rash testified, neighbors help neighbors, and neighbors help the police. There are really only two questions for you to answer to reach your verdict in the charges that the state has brought against Greg McMichael. Did Greg McMichael have reasonable and probable grounds of suspicion to believe that Ahmad Arbery had committed a burglary at 220 Satilla Drive? And did he have reasonable and probable grounds to believe that Ahmad Arbery was escaping or attempting to escape yet again on February 23rd? It is a nine count indictment. Nine counts. So why only two questions? Well, I want to suggest to you what the state suggested, but in reverse. I'd like to suggest a methodical, efficient way to think about all this law and all these charges. I suggest that you begin at the beginning. Count one, malice murder. 
and then take all the rest of those counts, two through nine, as one big chunk as you consider these important questions. Even count one, that malice murder count, is defended by the answers to those questions. But with malice murder, I suggest to you, you don't even have to get to those questions. Greg McMichael pulled no trigger. How could the state seek a conviction for malice murder as Greg stood in the bed of the pickup truck on the phone with 911 as the fatal shots were fired as a party to the crime? Ms. Dunikoski told you about the law that the judge will give you. If someone intentionally helps or aids or procures or hires or assists in the commission of a crime, they can be as guilty as the principal, as the person who fired the shots. But what is so very different about count one is that it's malice murder. It requires the desire and the intent to kill, the deliberate intention to take the life of another human being. Where all of the circumstances of the killing, show that an individual acted with an abandoned and malignant heart. The state will have to be asking you to find that Greg McMichael advised or encouraged <clears throat> Travis McMichael, his son, to take the life of Ahmaud Arbery because that's what he wanted to do. For no reason other than to see that young man die. And to see him die at the hands of his own son. And to do it right there in front of his eyes. Because the guy keeps breaking down and breaking into that house down the street. That's the level of criminal intent, the level of depravity, heartlessness, sickness that you would need to find beyond a reasonable doubt to find Greg McMichael guilty of malice murder. That's why I suggest that you begin with count one and quickly dispatch of it with a not guilty verdict. And then move down to the remaining counts, counts two through nine, because it comes down to this. If Greg McMichael was authorized by law to attempt to execute a citizen's arrest, to try to detain Ahmad Arbery for the police to come and do their job, to try to keep peace and safety within that neighborhood, then they were within the law to hold him there for the police. How else does one hold an individual who does not want to be arrested for the police? You have to contain him, not false imprison him, contain him. You have to possibly hold him at gunpoint without firing a shot, not an aggravated assault, but the use of a reasonable and measured amount of force to make him stay where he did not want to stay. So if they were acting within the law in trying to execute a citizen's arrest, to detain Ahmaud Arbery for the police, then Travis had every single right to defend himself when Ahmaud Arbery inexplicably took that sharp left turn at the right front of the truck seeking to disarm Travis McMichael. So, Who's got to prove what? We begin as we always begin in a courtroom, with innocence. And we stay there unless and until the state proves to you that this was not a citizen's arrest and that Travis was not justified in defending himself against Ahmaud Arbery's attack. And they have to convince you of that. Remove 
your belief in that citizen's arrest or justification to <coughs> such a degree that you've got left nothing in your minds to doubt it. And that sounds like an enormous burden. Why? Because they have to make you sure of it. You have to have no hesitation, no ambivalence, absolute certainty, because the stakes are as high as they come. It's the highest level of proof we ever ask for in a courtroom. The court will tell you, when they say murder, and the facts raise justification, and the judge will tell you, justification is self-defense, justification is citizen's arrest. That when that, the facts are raised to support those defenses, that the state has to disprove them that you were justified. But why? Why is the standard so incredibly high? And the answer is something you witnessed in this very courtroom. Even in science, errors can happen. And without diligent investigation and inquiry, people can be convicted on the slightest errors, stripped of their freedom for another's inattention or mistakes. Imagine if Dr. Donahue, with all that experience, who made the decision, the conclusion, that the muzzle to target range, the end of Travis's shotgun to the chest of Ahmad Arbery was four feet away based on a photograph he compared in a book without having watched the video and more egregiously, without even having looked at the clothes that covered Ahmad Arbery's body. Imagine if that initial conclusion had been all you knew in this case, wouldn't that have misled you? Wouldn't that have led you to wonder how what you saw in that video could match the opinion of a scientist? Imagine if Brian Leopard hadn't tested a Maude Arbery shirt and scientifically concluded, based on that stippling, that these were contact or near contact wounds. Imagine further if I hadn't emailed Dr. Donahue to take another look at his conclusions based upon the clothing and Brian Leopard's expert report and further imagine if Dr. Donahue was not an honorable scientist, if he wasn't willing to admit he'd made a mistake and take another look at the science. So that instead of three to four feet, we now know it's contact or three inches. Three inches <clears throat> as opposed to four feet. That is a demonstration to you why the system has to work this way, why the state has such a high burden with evidence that leaves absolutely no reason to doubt before any one of you can consider declaring that a man seeking to protect himself and his community is a murderer. You determine the facts, and the judge will tell you the law. So of course, you need to be given the facts accurately and completely. The painful beauty of this case is that almost all of it is recorded. Security videos from outside people's homes on Satilla, in Satilla Shores, difficult to listen to 911 tapes, and then of course, 
the really hard thing to look at. The cell phone video that captured the last moments. Based on those undisputed recorded facts, still in the face of all that you heard and saw, the state's case demonstrated in opening state, what Mr. Hope told you in opening statement. He told you Greg McMichael was absolutely certain and he was absolutely right. You were so attentive and I thank you for that. We all do. You took a lot of notes and there was a lot of things to take notes about. So you know that the very first words out of Greg McMichael's mouth is that there was no doubt in his mind as to who this guy was. He told Officer Brandeberry that, and it was captured on the body cam that you saw. And later, in, interviewed at the GB, excuse me, interviewed at the Glynn County Police Department by Parker Marcy, that investigator told you, here's his statement, here's what he told me. I watched him, and when he came by me, I got a good, really good look at him. So I mean, it's the same guy. And it was Ahmad Arbery on the video. He was an intruder. Larry English had reported because he believed that an intruder had taken thousands of dollars of boat equipment off the offshore boat that had been parked in his RV parking garage. It was Ahmad Arbery returning night after night without authority to a place where valuables were stored with no legitimate reason for being there. And it was Ahmad Arbery, as Greg McMichael told immediately after being questioned, who had hauled ass from that house on February 23rd after he'd looked through the window at Matt Albenze on the phone that he ran from that home. Add all that knowledge, that certainty, to what he learned when Travis jumped into the truck and shared with him what he saw on the driver's Back side to, of that truck. That's not an evidence. And I object to, th th this is never an evidence. And the state objects to arguing facts not an evidence. Your Honor, I believe that is an evidence. And I believe that Travis McMichael testified and these statements that I'm talking about did come into evidence. I believe it could be up to the jury to remember the evidence. These are, <laughs> all right, ladies and gentlemen, it is up to the jury to recall the evidence that has been presented in this trial. And what lawyers say is not evidence. So it is up to you to recall what the evidence is in the case and to go ahead and um, address this matter on that basis. I don't have a complete listing of all statements made, but it's up to you, ladies and gentlemen, to recall that. And just because a lawyer says something, again, does not mean it is evidence, and this is argument. Go ahead. You will be the decider of the facts. You took the notes, and I trust what you will remember from this trial, that Travis <clears throat> jumped into the driver's seat of that truck after having seen Matt Albenze standing in front of 220 Satilla Drive and pointing down that street, signaling down that street. That the man that Travis McMichael had seen only 11 days earlier with his own eyes and then slowly pulled up alongside so that he could confirm for himself Dad's right. This is the guy. And the judge will tell you. You will gather the facts from the totality <coughs> of the circumstances. Did they have a reasonable and probable cause to believe that this was the guy? 
And you can know, and the judge will tell you, that you gather that from every sense that you have. Your hearing, your sight, your sense of what's going on around you. Certainty, though, is a way higher standard than what you even need to find in this case. Certainty was way more knowledge than they needed to detain Ahmad Arbery to execute a citizen's arrest. And that was Greg McMichael's intent. He said it from the very beginning. He was asked by the investigator, Parker Marcy testified to you. What was your intent had he, had, had he stopped? And he said, as clear as a bell, hold him for the police so that he could be arrested. The judge will charge you that a private citizen can effectuate an arrest, detaining someone for the police to arrive if a crime happens within his knowledge. Oops, there's the other one or his immediate presence. Thanks, Jason. I appreciate it. So here's what you have to know. That you haven't yet heard from the state there are no magic words that are required. The court will tell you there's nothing special you have to say to be effectuating a citizen's arrest. There's nothing special you can't say while effectuating a citizen's arrest. If it happens within your knowledge or immediate presence, then you can effectuate a citizen's arrest and criminal trespass the court will tell you, going on someone's property without the authority and for an unlawful purpose is, citizen, is, a, is a crime, the misdemeanor offense of citizen's arrest. And again, what you haven't heard from the state and got some misdirection about, there's no requirement, Judge Walmsley will tell you, for a posting of a no trespassing sign. There's no requirement that any officer execute this trespass warning. It's your place and people should stay off it. We don't need to be telling people ahead of time and giving them warnings if you don't want to. And he'll also charge you that a private citizen can effectuate an arrest, detaining someone for the goal of holding them for the police if he has reasonable grounds of suspicion to believe that a suspect is fleeing or attempting to flee from a felony. Burglary is a felony. Entering a dwelling place without authority with the intent to commit a theft in there. Not an actual theft, but the reason, the mindset for going into a place that's not yours. So how do you know that if there wasn't actually an, a theft? Judge Walmsley will tell you. The law will allow you to infer an intent to steal. If there's an unlawful entry, meaning crossing into a place that's not yours, a place where valuables are stored, and you heard testimony that plenty of valuables were stored at 220 Satilla Drive, with no other apparent motive for being there. That means every single time Ahmad Arbery goes into that house, he is committing a burglary. But you hardly needed a jury instruction to tell you that. Coming into someone else's house at night where it's pitch dark repeatedly, even after you've been run off, into a place where an offshore boat is holding expensive equipment, 
the intruder comes in, and sometime after that intruder has left, your stuff is gone. Reasonable grounds of suspicion is nothing more than probable cause. And probable cause, as Mr. Sheffield and the court will tell you, are facts necessary to establish a probability, more likely than not. It's less than certainty, but it's more than mere suspicion. So think of it this way. If Officer Rash had been on one of his patrols in Satilla Shores on February 23rd at about 1.08 PM, and as he turned onto Satilla Drive, he saw Matt Albenze, who he'd already met, up standing in front of 220 Satilla Drive, just signaling down that street. And down that street, high tail in it, is Ahmaud Arbery, the man that Officer Rash had seen on those video cameras over and over again. So if he saw and heard what these men did, he too would have had probable cause to arrest Ahmad Arby for the crime of burglary. There's no doubt he would have put on his sirens and tried to stop Ahmad Arbery. And there's no doubt, after the events of February 11th, that Officer Rash would have had his gun at the ready and not taken any chances. And I suspect, in your minds, there would be no doubt that Ahmad Arbery would have known exactly why he was being chased. Because there can be little doubt as well that Ahmaud Arbery knew exactly why the McMichaels were trying to detain him on February 23rd. The truth of life is that it's very complicated. A beautiful teenager with a broad smile in a crooked baseball cap can go astray. He can deteriorate and lose his way. And years later, he can end up creeping into a home that is not his own and running away instead of facing the consequences, acting erratically when approached and making terrible, unexpected, illogical choices. But a mother's love doesn't fade from that beautiful boy in the ball cap to the young intruder. And sadly, no verdict can change the grief of that future not realized. The hope that he could have turned himself around. Because all we can guess about the young man is that his teenage years were full of promise, but his early 20s just led him in the wrong direction. The facts presented in this trial bear no resemblance to the story that the state told you in opening statement. A 25-year-old who met a brutal death after being chased and killed by residents of a neighborhood who wanted nothing more than to murder him for having the audacity to jog in their neighborhood. Not a single piece of evidence that's been presented to you in this entire trial supports such a hateful and gruesome set of circumstances. Turning Ahmad Arbery into a victim after the choices that he made does not reflect 
the reality of what brought Ahmad Arbery to Satilla Shores in his khaki shorts with no socks to cover his long, dirty toenails. There were two sets of decision makers on February 23rd. It is not just the McMichael's decisions that led to this tragedy. And it is a tragedy. I see it in your faces, and I have felt it in mine. A young life lost, grieving parents. Greg and Travis didn't have to do anything on February 23rd. Greg could have looked up from his boat cushions, saw a marred arbory run past, and shrug his shoulders. Maybe call 911. Maybe call Officer Rash. Maybe text Diego Perez. And the fear and the frustration of this neighborhood would continue. But Greg McMichael's driveway decision wasn't the only decision that set this tragedy in motion. Ahmad Arbery was not an innocent victim plundering through Larry English's house on February 23rd just as he wasn't an innocent victim all the other nights, like October 25th, or November 18th, or December 15th, or February 11th. Is he the person responsible for stealing Larry English's expensive boat equipment? I don't know. We don't know. No one investigated that. But can anyone reasonably believe that Ahmad Arbery was just do doing a looky-loo on those nights in what has been described and shown to you as a home drenched in absolute darkness. The judge will instruct you that you must use common sense and reason. Common sense and reason. There was no legitimate reason for Ahmad Arbery to be plundering through Larry English's house those four nights, and again on the afternoon of February 23rd. Ahmad didn't live there, he didn't work there, he didn't have friends there. He didn't have a girlfriend there. He wasn't hanging out with a friend in that neighborhood who was a friend of a friend. He didn't jog through that neighborhood. He was a recurring nighttime intruder. And that is frightening and unsettling. A looky-loo in an open, unsecured construction site. Why did we have to withstand that drumbeat? Why? Let's clear a few things up. The judge will charge you that for burglary purposes, a dwelling is any structure that is intended for residential use. It makes no difference if it's occupied, being built, under construction, unoccupied, or vacant. And that only makes sense. How could you ever build a home if it wasn't really yours to protect until it was done? For that matter, how could you ever expect your stuff to be safe when your teenager forgets to close the garage door? Really, with all the important law to consider, why the misdirection? Why? And why the insensitivity to the neighbors of Satilla Shores? It's only a looky-loo when it isn't your neighborhood. It's only an open, un un open, unsecured construction site when it's not the building of your dream home, hastened by this impending fatal 
illness of Larry English's. It's only a property crime when you're not Subi Lawrence, across the street from that house, living alone, trying to raise three rambunctious boys, and you can't even let them outside to play. It's only a property crime if you're not Diego and Brooke Perez, trying to raise three little girls safely next door to 220 Satilla Drive. No one but Ahmad Arbery made the decision to repeatedly and unlawfully enter into that house over and over again. No one but Ahmad Arbery made the decision to run like the wind when the police car responded to the calls from the owner and the neighbors. No one but Ahmad Arbery made the decision to either reach for or certainly give the very real impression that he was reaching for a handgun on February 11th, and then to yet again run away when the police arrived. And no one but Ahmad Arbery made the decision not to stop when Travis's truck rolled up beside him. To wait to tell the police what he was doing there. Or just plain run away into the woods or in the culverts that you'll see all over the state's evidence or the open yards or the open garages or yell the word help or just keep going right straight down Satilla Drive right into Officer Minshew's patrol car. I realize probably more than any of you what an incredibly unpopular thing that is to say. But in a courtroom with Greg McMichael facing the charge of murder, somebody's got to say it. And believe me, I'm proud to be the one to say it. Not to cause harm, not to cause pain, but because the truth in this place is really all that matters. Be very clear, be very clear. No one is saying that Ahmad Arbery deserved to die for whatever it was he was doing inside 220 Satilla Drive because that's not why he died. He died because for whatever inexplicable, illogical reason, instead of staying where he was, whatever overwhelming reason he had to avoid being captured that day and arrested by the police, he chose to fight. He chose to fight to, without un any sense of reason, to run at a man wielding a shotgun, leaving him with no other alternative but to be placed in the position of killing another human being. <clears throat> Greg McMichael had probable cause through all that he saw, all that he heard, all that he knew to believe reasonably that Ahmad Arbery had committed a crime and that he was fleeing from it yet again. If the state hasn't removed every doubt, every single reasonable logical doubt in your mind 
that Greg McMichael was attempting a citizen's arrest, attempting to simply detain Ahmad Arbery for the police on February 23rd, then you have reached your verdict, ladies and gentlemen, on counts two through nine. If they can't strip you of any reason to doubt the evidence that's been presented to you on citizen's arrest, but if they have left you wanting to know more, if they have left you wanting to inquire into the next steps of these offenses, there are still more steps. One of those is causation. How any of the other acts in counts two through nine, other than the actual shooting of Ahmad Arbery, could have been the direct cause of Ahmad Arbery's death. Or, that it would have played a substantial and necessary part in causing the death. You would have to find that the goal of trying to detain Ahmad Arbery for the police without using any excessive force, no fists, no discharge of the weapon, before that left turn attack on Travis, then the case is over yet again on counts two through nine. It would have to be not guilty because there would have been no causation between the counts that don't involve the actual discharge of that firearm. And then if you wanted to go one further step, you would have to ask yourself about Greg's role in all of this while riding in the back of the pickup truck. As a party to the crime, the state would have to prove to you that Travis McMichael Inten excuse me, that Gregory McMichael intentionally helped in the commission of the shooting or advised, encouraged, hired, counseled, or procured Travis McMichael to shoot Ahmaud Arbery as he was on the phone with 911 shouting the word no. Without proof beyond a reasonable doubt of all of those pieces, all of those elements, the state simply has not met their case. When I sit down, I get no more chance to speak with you, and that's a tough thing for me. I have to know that the state gets the last word. So given the state's opening and some of their cross-examination of witnesses, despite how careful I know you all were with your notepads and pens, with your attention, with your focus, I have to raise a few more things to make sure you notice them because the stakes are so incredibly high. Ms. Donikoski told you in her initial closing argument, she was afraid that we'd persuade you <laughs> of the things that we're sharing with you about the state's case. I'm afraid that she's going to cherry pick. Cherry picking is this, it's choosing and taking only the most beneficial items from all that's been provided to you and trying to turn that into a fact. Don't look over there at all the rest of the stuff. Just look at these beautiful cherries I've picked. Context determines meaning. Stop. And you heard it all the way through the trial. Cross-examination versus the actual 
reality that I think I saw you all wrote it right down of what Greg McMichael told Parker Marcy and what the investigators testified about what it really meant and when it really was supposed to have happened. Greg McMichael said that horrible sentence or something. Stop, he said to the investigator. I said to him, stop. But most importantly, what we now know is that Greg McMichael fought in the panic and adrenaline and fear and ugh, of that horrible situation. He thought that's what he said at the very end of this encounter. Mr. Hogue cross-examined every witness who was with Greg McMichael when he shared that piece of information. The DA wants to make you think, by cherry picking, that Greg McMichael said that anywhere, anytime, over and over, all through, anywhere through the pathway. But what those witnesses, those investigators and officers told you is that Greg McMichael was talking about the final encounter. Officer Brandeberry was asked, when did you understand he was telling you he said that? And Officer Brandeberry said, he's talking about the final encounter on Holmes Road. Yes, that's my understanding. Parker Marcy was asked, when would that have occurred? Would that have occurred, giving the context of the full statement, which because of the laws in this courtroom you, and around the state of Georgia, you cannot have all of the statement read to you. So there had to be context. And that gets a little dicey. And that's why you have to be extra careful when you're sharing that information with a jury. So Mr. Ho cross-examined those officers to say, let's draw down on when that was supposed to have happened. He said it was supposed to have happened at the final confrontation. The same place where Greg's on the phone with 911? Yes. That's what he thought he said. So whatever he said on 911, Mr. Hogue asked the investigator, would that be the most accurate way of knowing what he really said? And that investigator, just like all of you, would say, of course. Whatever you heard, whatever the state presented in the 911 call, whatever you can listen to again, bears no resemblance to what Greg McMichael, after a stroke, and the panic and the fear and the sadness of those moments when he was interviewed thought that he said on the 911 call. You're the decider of the facts. You're the ones that are going to have to make the decision about what's true and what's not true about this case. Jason Sheffield said the word red herring. So I went ahead and looked it up. I've always heard that phrase. And the definition is something that's intended to be misleading or distracting. So I'm going to tell you I've got one more concern before I sit down. And that is, and I could be completely wrong about this, but I'm concerned about it. So I want to share it with you since I can't come back up in case my suspicions are correct. I'm afraid of why the state kept introducing into evidence still shots of Greg McMichael with various people at the scene. I noted them in the beginning, thinking it wasn't any big deal. I take down a lot of notes, like you all do. And then I kept seeing a pattern. And again, Ms. Donikowski, I could be completely wrong about this. But I'm concerned that Ms. Donikowski is now digging so deep 
to make this case, that she's going to suggest to you that Greg McMichael was on that scene manipulating testimony and evidence. It seems kind of wild when you think that the whole event is on video and that the people that came in with that video said it hadn't been altered or changed in any way. And that Officer Minshew is there in seconds on the scene, and we see everything that's happening on his body cam. In fact, it was Travis and Greg who waved him down. But there's photos of Greg comforting his son. There's a photo of Greg McMichael after 30 years in law enforcement having a conversation with Captain Tom Jump. There's evidence that the film, Ms. Officer Minshew said, Roddy's got this on the film, and, Tra and Greg was able to say, Travis, it's captured on film. There's a screenshot of Diego talking to Greg, even though Officer Adam Jackson, who testified, said, I spoke to Diego Perez. He said, I got some camera footage, you want it? And we got the security camera footage from Diego Perez through Adam Jackson unadulterated and presented to you. So I just have to say, thank goodness that as awful as those recordings are to hear and see, they reflect the truth of what happened, who did what and why. And there is no way to suggest that there was any manipulation of evidence or testimony at the scene. So now, it's time very soon, probably not soon enough for you, but very soon, for you to deliberate and reach a verdict. A verdict rendered by members of your community about an event that happened in your community. Glynn County, filled with communities that are filled with neighbors. Why did it take us 11 days to select you? Well, the media descended on this case. And unless, I think several of you said, unless you lived under a rock, you knew something about the case. Some facts that were accurate, some facts that were ridiculous, and some facts that were outright slanted for shock value. And we as humans do, we begin to form opinions when we begin to hear things that we believe could be facts. And then there's the social media. People posting arguments, comments, and opinions. And then with the algorithm of Facebook, you're going to get more and more of the same opinions and comments and opinions that are like the opinions that you seem to be interested in. And next thing you know, you think that these people's opinions are facts. And the other issue is this is a small county. Many of the jurors that were summoned knew the defendants. Many of the jurors that were summoned knew the Arbories. Many of the jurors that were summoned knew people who were close to people who knew either one of them. And consistent with human nature, those folks had formed opinions. So why are you the 15 that remained? Because you were determined to be the people most likely to do what I submit to you is the impossible. To set aside opinions and beliefs you'd formed before you came into court. To set aside facts that you thought were accurate before you came to court. And to promise with your oath, hand to God, to base your verdict only on what you hear in this courtroom. It's kind of a ridiculous standard, but it's all we've got for these men to have their day in court. 
And we had to assess your honesty. We had to assess your candor, your truthfulness, that you would do what you said you would do. This incredible, awesome responsibility that you've been selected to undertake. Jury deliberations are not like a meeting. They're not like a business meeting where you're going to each put in your opinions and thoughts and reach an agreement, a little give and take. It's not like going to buy a car and you're dickering over the price. It's not even like the legislature when they're trying to come up with a budget. Hey, this is the stuff I really want in my packet, and this is the stuff I really want in my packet. I'll give up a little bit of this if you give up a little bit of that. That is not at all how jury deliberations work. Because you see, compromise has absolutely no place in the deliberative process. The judge will instruct you, keep an open mind, talk with each other, consider each other's points of view, but the bottom line, ladies and gentlemen, is that each of you will form this verdict on your own. You are the gatekeepers of this jury process. You're the gatekeepers of the oath that you each took. If some of you feel strongly one way and others of you feel strongly the other way, keep talking, keep working. This is important. But you are not to give up any opinions you have, any thoughts and beliefs you have, just to get along or just to be unanimous. You are not to consider what the possible punishments just might be. You can't have the kind of conversation that says, well, you know, that malice murder, that is kind of ridiculous given the facts of this case. So let's just agree on that felony murder. That can't be that bad. It's got to be less than the malice murder. Or, you know, some of you really want felony murder, and some of you really want not guilty. What if we just sort of meet in the middle with one of those ag assaults? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I encourage you, I beg you, to slam on the brakes if you hear any conversations like that in the jury room. The only thing you're asking yourself is whether the state removed every logical reason for you to doubt that Greg McMichael had the requisite knowledge and intent to execute a citizen's arrest. And if, he, if that's the case, then not guilty is the only verdict you can reach. Because every single count in this indictment is so serious. And every single count in this indictment is life changing for Greg McMichael. Your deliberations should be guided by the rule that the judge will give you. If in any way your minds are wavering, unsettled, unsatisfied, then that is a doubt of the law and you must acquit. <laughs>